Hey, welcome everyone to this tutorial on domain name system. This is Vivek and today we are going to discuss about DNS in detail. So the agenda for today is we are going to see what exactly DNS is, what DNS namespace looks like, the DNS name servers, DNS resource records, the resolver, what exactly a DNS client is, DNS message formats, resolution process, zones, protocols used and some of the important key players in DNS system. So let's start. What is a DNS? DNS stands for Domain Name System. It is used to translate host name into the IP address. So why this is important? Why you need a DNS system? You can always access a system using the IP address or the address internet protocol address of the system. So uh, you can use the IP address to access the system, but imagine remembering an IP address like 74.125.236.48 instead of www.google.com or my name say vivek.com. Even if I am trying to communicate to someone else, hey, this is an interesting website, try opening vivek.com or google.com. I would be saying a long length of IP address, that is IPv4. Imagine the condition when IPv6 is in place. So DNS definitely makes our task easier. So and the essence of DNS is invention of hierarchical domain based name scheme and distributed database system for implementing this naming scheme. So don't worry about these terminologies. We are going to see each and everything in detail. So as I said, the domain names are easier to understand. Uh, you can relate it to the, to the phone book uh, we typically used to have or you maintain in your uh, mobile devices. In phone book, you just type the name and you try to call that person. You don't actually need to remember the long IP, uh, long phone number of that person whom you are trying to contact. Similarly, you don't need to remember the IP addresses. It's easier to ma manage. It's easier to scale. So behind an IP address, um, there might be many servers acting or in case you want to change the IP address, so you want to um, upgrade your system or swap the system with a higher uh, capacity system. So you don't need to change your identity of the identity of the website. The google.com remains same. That's why it's important to maintain a DNS if you are trying to safeguard your identity it's not going to change it's a brand name right now mail servers aliasing even if you are trying to create a mail address it will be very easier for you something like vivek at the rate of google.com it's easier than vivek at the rate of 74.125.236.48 like that it's also useful in load distribution same domain name can have multiple A records that we are going to see what exactly A record looks like and we can load balance. So in DNS namespace if you see it start with a dot that is root of your domain. So in case you are trying to type a website called the http colon slash slash maps.google.com then uh, it start with a root where a root is always not visible it's a dot that dot represented here now then comes the next level here in this example we have taken dot com it can be dot edu dot net dot in dot nl these are the top level domain names now further we can break each of these dot com into different website names like microsoft dot com yahoo dot com akamai dot com google dot com these are different second level domain these are the domain names which you actually go and register with your registrar we are going to see what exactly a registrar is now under google we have a subdomain called maps or you can have www or you can have mail so that mail comes here or maps comes here that is called subdomain now each label these are the labels each labels can be of 63 characters and total name can be of 255 character length. So name cannot be greater than 255 character. Now, now we are going to see what exactly a DNS name server looks like. So what exactly a DNS name server? So uh, 
going back to the time when DNS was not in the place, people used to just access the system using the IP addresses. When the IP addresses increased, people solved that challenge by having a local text file where everyone used to write the IP addresses and what name it should resolve to. So that name to IP resolution happened in the local host file, a local text file. Now that was not a very scalable solution as the number of system increased, <coughs> these entries also increased. So it was difficult to manage plus every time you need to ensure that your local text file is always updated the new entries it was difficult to manage so then came this this distributed system of domain name servers these are the servers which are actual responsible for translation of your domain name into the ip addresses these can be of different types like local name server, authoritative name servers, primary name server, secondary name server, and root name servers. So globally right now we have 13 root name servers. So these 13 root name servers are not just 13 numbers, but basically it's there are 13 system that may be multiple servers working behind that those IP addresses. How we can look into that? I'm going to show you a screen. I'll use a command line utility called dig. We'll just hit dig and enter. We got these 13 server IP addresses or names here c.rootservers.net, d.rootservers.net. It starts with A. So these are total 13 in numbers, but the, behind these names, there may be multiple IP addresses or multiple servers acting because it's distributed in nature. Plus, it has to be scalable because. <laughs> If these 13 servers or uh, the entire system of 13 servers goes down, the internet will break. And trust me, it's very, very, very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult to bring down these all set of servers. Let's try to find the IP address of one of the domains that we have here. We'll try c.rootservers.net. All right, it got result to an IP address. So this is a tool that I'm using. It's called dig. Uh, you can also try using NS lookup. It does the same on Windows system. It will provide you the IP address of the domain name that you're trying to look at. It can provide you any multiple de additional details as well, but that is not uh, we are going to discuss now. So uh, we'll talk about these name servers in details we saw what root name servers looks like so root name server will not resolve the ip addresses we will see what exactly it does is one of the slides uh, local name server so each and every internet service provider has a local name server these host a dns query uh, these the system hosts a system uh, the system hosts a local uh, database of caching servers like they cache the entries like what exactly the google.com is going to resolve it if the entry is cached for uh, n seconds it's not going to ask for the resolution again for the next n seconds like here we see there are various fields here so this value it's nothing but the ttl the time to live of this entry so this is going to have 148512 second cached so for next so and so second it's not going to ask for the resolution resolution for this domain name then comes the authoritative name servers so these are the name servers which are responsible for or which are authoritative for the top level domain names like dot com dot org dot mil that is military so these servers are responsible only for that zone that we it's we are pointing it to like uh, if an authoritative name, name server is responsible for dot com it will only respond for the queries for dot com sites now next comes the primary name servers and secondary name servers these are two ident almost identical servers i'll say uh, these are the name servers which actually does the translation for a requested domain name into the ip addresses how the entire flow looks like it might not be very clear to you till this slide but we are going to see in one of the subsequent slides 
as I have written primary name servers each zone will have a primary name server and more secondary name servers and secondary servers retrieve information from primary name servers there is a thing called zone transfer that is like kind of database that transfers from primary name servers to secondary name servers and these are the secondary name servers which actually handles the load which actually does the work and primary name servers just keeps the actual database and secondary copies from primary cool now next we are going to discuss about DNS resource records so in DNS also is a request response kind of thing that is working when you request for a name resolution in the response there are multiple resource records that, that are handed over to the client so every domain can have a set of resource records associated with it it has five tuple resource record values first is domain name second time to live third is class then type and the value so in one of the slides we saw or one of the screen we saw this particular tool being used so you see one two three four and five so the first one was the domain name then this was was ttl that i that is time to live then third one was class that is internet type it is a record and the value of a record is this IP address 192.33.4.12 cool similarly it can have <coughs> different types of resource record like MX record that is responsible for handling the mail data another important resource record is C name C name is called canonical name so ABC suppose there is a website ABC it can be aliased to some other canonical name let's say, take an example we will type dig and we'll type dub 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 um, maybe dot India times dot com okay so India times dot com is C named to w dot dot India times dot com hyphen v2 dot h key dot net now what it is so now this domain name is C named to this particular entry which is nothing but then um, it's a edge key name or edge host name from uh, a CDN provider called Akamai so they uh, does all the delivery for this website so it's basically telling okay so from now onwards the IP resolution is going to handle it by this name and this name is getting again C named to another name right now here so what internal internally it happened is www.indiatimes.com was c named to www.indiatimes.com hyphen v2 dot h key dot nip and internally it got translated to this particular ip address the ip address was 23 or 58 or 38 or 239 so suppose there is a need to change the ip address now the www.indiatimes.com need not worry about any of the things it will just have the C name continue to be in place and the person who is responsible for edge key dot net he has access to the zone file or the, to the record sets associated with dot edge key dot net he will change the settings on his site so that the arena times dot com hyphen v2 dot edge key dot net is right now it's getting resolved to this AIP it might get resolved to BIP if needed so that's the function of C name record now we are going to see in the next slide what a resolver is so resolver is nothing but a dns client it is responsible for initiating the process to get the ip address dns client is also called a resolver full resolver is a program distinct from a user program which forwards all the query to the name servers for processing so there is a thing called a caching server which is uh, so DNS caching can happen at multiple places right from the in right from the your browser when you type the google.com the browser caches when it gets the result from the name server so the IP address resolution is cached at Google site uh, at your browser site next it, it's it, it is it goes to your ISV name server there also it gets cached so user program is a browser here it has a full resolver which maintains a cache request to the name server 
Now its name server, how it does, we are going to see in the subsequent slide the resolution process in detail. So it res responds with an IP address that that resolution is cached here for subsequent requests and then the user program gets its response. Then the HTTP connection or subsequent request initiates. Now this is a simple flow right now we saw. Now there is a call, thing called stub resolver. Previously we saw full resolver. And here is stub resolver. So stub resolver is a routine linked to the user program which forwards the queries to DNS server. It just forwards the queries. It's it's not having any cache associated with it, right? So function is same. It tries to find the A record for the user program. Now we'll see the DNS message format. So DNS query and reply messages both use the same message format. It has headers, then the query. Now, uh, message flags are can be of different types. So, you see that there is a QR that that if it's a query, the value will have zero. If it's a response, it will have a value one. AA stands for authoritative server or authoritative answer. TC stands for response truncated. If it's greater than five hundred twelve bytes, the response was truncated. RD stands for recursion desired, and RA stands for recursion available. So DNS message format looks like this. It contains headers, queries, responsive RR and response RR. Okay. And then there are different message flags which tells whether it's a query or as a response. Whether it's an authoritative answer or it's a TC or RD or RA. Now question format looks like it's a name and the value will be domain name or IP address. Then query type whether it's A record, NS, what kind of query you are requesting for. The query class whether one or I for IP. So DNS queries can be recursive or iterative. So you might be wondering what exactly this is. So you can either use this dig tool to look into the details or if you're not very familiar with this tool, I will recommend that uh, you go to a website called dig web interface. I'll show you how it looks like. Dig web interface. Type here www indiatimes.com and suppose I want a name server for indiatimes.com like who is responsible for indiatimes.com uh, which name server is responsible for that so I have selected a type as name server I clicked on dig so we got a response here so it's not having in this record it's having C name records so an important thing to notice here is when CNAME exists, you cannot have NS record or SO or A record associated with that. All right, but I'll show you an example where CNAME does not exist. I'll take example of www.tkn.com. You see that it's having NS as NS18.ethii.com and NS17.ethii.com. Now, if I want to have just the A record, okay, it will give me the value of A record. So this is how we are sending a query right now. If you just want to see the entire trace, you can click on trace here and it will show you. Okay, it went to root, then we got some response and finally uh, it goes, it went to this particular name, ser uh, name server and we got the IP address in the result, uh, result or the response. So play around with this tool a little bit and you will feel more comfortable using that. Cool. So we'll move to the next slide where we will be talking about recursive versus non-recursive query, the one which we have written in the last line. So the query can be resolved in two ways. One is a recursive query and second is non-recursive query. The recursive query initiates from a client the query goes to a local name server it checks in its cache it sees if the value of the resolve IP address is present here or not then it goes to root name server root name server sees whether the value is present there or not it will it won't be having that it will tell okay you are requesting for suppose dns dot e u r e c u m dot f r Okay, so this is not what I do, but you know what dot fr domains are handled by this particular guy. Hey dot fr, why don't you answer this question? 
and then the response is received and that goes to the client in non recursive query when a request is initiated from the client is go it goes to a local name server so here if you see it's the local name server which is doing the entire entire task and that is very much relevant how exactly in today's real world the dns resolution takes place a request goes to a local name server it checks whether the uh, entry is present in the cache or not if it's present then well and good it will just re response with the result if not it checks suppose the request is for dot fr or dot com it goes to a root server and tells hey i don't need the ip address to resolve resolution for that or google.com root says no i don't have the details why don't you ask with dot com tld or dot fr tld it goes to dot uh, com or dot fr tld uh, uh, authoritative name server it checks uh, says that hey uh, do you have the ip address for google.com he said okay uh, i know the name server who is responsible for handling the queries for www.google.com here is the name server why don't you ask with them then it gets the ip address of the authoritative server for www.google.com then the local resolver initiates a request to the name server for google.com and ask hey i want the ip address for www.google.com and then the answer is received and then it caches one entry here and responds to the client so this is how the recursive and non recursive or iterative query looks like remember one thing if in today's world if someone asks you or you need to see how the resolution takes place in real life that's the iterative or non recursive query so what we spoke in previous slide this the same thing is represented here in a better way dns recursor uh, initiates a request saying that hey where is wikipedia.com root says okay i don't have that try this particular ip address they handle start org it says okay hey dot org why don't you give me the ip address of wikipedia.org he says okay i handle dot org and i don't have the details but why don't you go and ask this uh, this particular name server which handles the query for the dot dot or wikipedia dot org okay it gives the ip address then dns recursor goes to uh, the wikipedia dot org name server which we got here and they say dude i need the ip address of dot dot wikipedia dot org i says okay here you go this is the ip and dns recursor got the ip details again remember three points that we also spoke in one of the slides there there can be multiple levels but max level limit is 127 like this is first level this is second level this is wikipedia is first up to the second you can have multiple subdomains but 127 is max there can be max 63 character levels and the total max length to the entire name can be of 255 octets just few points to remember so till now we saw what exactly the dns uh looks like what exactly the name servers are wh who are responsible for doing what now there is a concept called zone that we are going to see in the next slide so this image you saw before also now what exactly a dns zone is so dns zone refers to a certain portion or administrative space within the global domain name system each dns zone represents a boundary of authoritative uh, subject to management by certain entities so like here suppose you have a website called yale.edu or eng.yale.edu or oxford.edu so this edu sub uh, edu name server authoritative name server is authoritative only for .edu zone next when it goes to yale you have a website called yale.com or oxford.com or google.com or oxford.edu yale.edu or google.com this google.com here is authoritative for all the names which comes as star.google.com something like maps.google.com or mail.google.com so these are zones it's nothing but delegation of authoritativeness so root is 
delegating the TLDs to different servers and these uh, top level or authoritative name servers are delegating the names to other name servers subsequently. So the authority of each DNS zone is delegated to a legal entity or an organization, something like a country code top level domain registry like for .in or a company or individual registered to use certain subdomains, something like if you are going to register www.vivek.com. So I will own vivek.com zone file with me and I can create multiple subdomains under that and I will be responsible for management of those entries in my zone file. So uh, not going too much in detail, uh, we will see how exactly the zone transfer happens from a primary to secondary. So in one of the slides we spoke there are primary servers and there are secondary servers. Now primary servers keeps this uh, entire zone with them, the database is with them, but it's 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 the master. The slaves are the secondary zones, uh, secondary name servers, which, which basically transfers the zone from primary to secondary, copies, and then it does all the work. These are the slaves. These are the actual workers, which resolves the IP address for the given name. So. Till now, we got a fair idea of what exactly zone is. Now, how this zone transfer take place from primary to secondary? So, uh, I'll just give you one point about the protocol. Uh, guess what protocol should be used for DNS resolution? And we will see. So, zone transfer happens between uh, a primary server to a secondary server. So. Secondary server can initiate a zone transfer using two methods, AXFR and IXFR. AXFR is uh, in, it's absolute in nature, like in that zone file has to be transferred from a primary name server to a secondary name server. IXFR is incremental transfer, incremental XFR, that is transfer. So uh, primary name servers has the zone file, the secondary file says, okay, dude, I need the copy of your zone for that zone file that you have. It will initiate a AXFR request, and then the zone transfer will take place. Now, if a secondary server already have some content of the zone file and the zone file was updated at primary, then it doesn't make sense to transfer entire zone file again and again. So, what secondary will does, and uh, while the zone file has updated, the a field associated with the zone file is called uh, like a kind of serial key is also updated so if a primary service has a zone files maybe a, you can say as a version or like 25 or 26 and secondary has a, a zone file which has a, a serial key associated with that serial number 20 so it says okay my uh, serial number of the zone file that I have is it's for 20 if it's updated send me the update so whatever incremental value the primary name server will have it will send it to the secondary server all right so we saw this zone transfer now in next slide we are going to talk about the protocol used so i gave you this question to think what protocols should be used so in dns resolution both udp and tcp are used so we are not going to talk about the differences between udp and tcp but one thing you should always remember UDP is for fast resolution or UDP is faster. TCP is for reliability. So most of the time you need speed in DNS resolution. Why? Because we all know we, everyone wants their website to come as fast as possible. So typically a DNS resolution takes place over UDP protocol. But when there is a reliability concern, there is a zone transfer happening between primary to secondary the TCP protocol is used or whenever there is a data uh, greater than 512 byte then TCP is used why because it breaks into multiple packets and we need to ensure we want to ensure that the entire data is intact so the points what I have mentioned here is TCP is used for transfer of entire database to secondary servers application UDP is for lookups the default port for DNS resolution is port 53 remember this 
and if more than 512 bytes in response request us resubmits request using TCP so if there is a data transfer happening more than 512 bytes it, the TCP will be used now let's see about what are different important players that play important roles in entire DNS system. One of the name comes is ICANN. So ICANN stands for the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It's a non-profit organization and that it's responsible for co coordinating and maintenance and the procedures of several databases related to the namespaces of DNS system. These are the people who actually maintains everything on the DNS you see today. They do charge a bit because they have to maintain, they have to run a business. Then next comes the registrar. So ICANN, ICANN is responsible or is the body responsible for deciding what domain TLDs are being used. If you want to add new TLD, uh, ICANN should approve it and they will decide. Then registrars are the player who help you with the registration process of your domain name like GoDaddy, Name.com, Namecheap. These are the famous registrars. You go to them, you tell them, okay, I want a domain name called Google.com. Can you, can you assign that to me? And the registrar will register this domain. It will register the domain to ICANN system. ICANN will charge a small fee to this registrars. And depending upon which registrar you are registering your domain to, they can charge you some amount. Like GoDaddy typically charges around uh, maybe $15 or $12 for the .com domain. I can might charge GoDaddy uh, maybe 20 cents. Now companies managing these TLDs, they're, they're, these are there are 13 root servers we saw. These root server will be managed by I can. That's fine. But what about .com authoritative servers? What about .mil, military servers? Because if these systems are hacked, anyone can tweak the entries and IP addresses resolution and suppose you are typing google.com, it may point to a malicious IP address or a fake page or a fake login page where you can end up losing your entire business or entire personal identifiable information or, is, or, in, or important data to the attacker. So some people are responsible for running those TLDs or uh, authoritative name servers companies like Verizon they do that they're good in that now there are different name servers at different levels so uh, you have I can you had registrar you had uh, root server you have uh, authoritative name name servers for TLDs now there are other caching servers or name servers also in place which basically handles DNS queries for you like Facebook has 4.4.4.4 if I remember correctly. Uh, Google has 8.8.8.8 and 8.8.4.4. If you are going for uh, open DNS, it's, I, if I remember correctly, it's 208.67.222.222 and 208.67.220.220. These are open DNS IP addresses. So you can use this custom <coughs> name servers for your DNS resolution. If you think that your ISP's name server is not doing good for you, it's blocking some sites for you, or it's slow for you, you can try using Google DNS servers and that will do the magic for name resolution in a faster way. So with this, we conclude this presentation here. If you have any additional questions, feel free to shoot out your question in the comments section and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot for watching this tutorial guys. Hope you have learned something from this and please do not forget to subscribe my channel so that you don't miss any update in the future.